While Australia may be a very long way from Hollywood, it's a country that has produced more than its fair share of screen icons. And with the country itself taking centre stage in Baz Luhrmann's latest epic, Australia looks set to become just as big in Tinseltown as its elegant, Oscar-winning homegrown star, Nicole Kidman. Like a few other notable Aussie stars who have made it big in the USA, Nicole had close ties to America from day one. She was born in Hawaii to Australian parents on June 20, 1967, giving her citizenship of both America and Australia, a fact that would come in very useful for her globe-trotting life to come. As a teenager growing up in North Sydney, Nicole earned the nickname Storky due to her striking height, a statuesque 5 foot 11. But self-consciousness was never a problem for Nicole, who even as a teenager had her goals very firmly in place. One of the reasons Nicole Kidman is where she is, is because she knew from childhood where she wanted to go. She was incredibly focused right from the start. And there's a story about her doing uh, an acting workshop at the age of 17 and standing out from everybody else there just because she was so focused and so totally committed and knew she wanted to be a professional actress and a really good one and a really famous one, even from that young age. She scored early roles in television dramas and won the affection of Australian audiences with films like Bush Christmas and BMX Bandits. In 1989, at the age of 22, she played the wife of a naval officer held captive on a Pacific Ocean yacht trip in the thriller Dead Calm. It's a major Hollywood film, Philip Noyce, the director, and there's only three actors in it, and most of the time it's just Nicole Kidman and Billy Zane on a yacht. He's a psycho killer. She has to go through a whole gamut of emotions, and it's a very physical role, and she's there the entire time. She really nails it. Dead Calm may have been the name of the movie, but Nicole's life was anything but. It wasn't long before she received a call asking her if she could come to Los Angeles to talk about a potential movie project and meet its star. The project was a film called Days of Thunder, and the star? None other than Hollywood Crown Prince Tom Cruise. It was a role that would set the Australian starlet on the path to becoming Hollywood royalty. Despite Nicole's initial worries about being noticeably taller than megastar Tom, she won the role of Dr. Claire Lewicki, the surgeon who gets an injured racing driver back behind the wheel. It seems Nicole's height didn't matter to Tom either, with speculation of an off-screen romance between the couple beginning even before filming was complete. Nicole and Tom denied the rumours until Tom's divorce from wife Mimi Rogers was finalised. The pair went public in 1990 and were married on Christmas Eve of that same year. Nicole and Tom were certainly a match made in heaven for gossip columnists and paparazzi. A marriage like this was about as close as Hollywood gets to a royal wedding and there was no way the press were going to leave the newly crowned king and queen of showbiz alone. But they would both have to acclimatise to the media's fascination with their private lives. No, you know what, I just, you just look at it and, and when they go far off then you sue and, you know, just certain things you just, you don't pay attention to and, uh, you know, mostly you just, you just have to go and live your life. You can't give, can't give it too much attention and, uh, you know, what else, what are you going to do? You know? well, you kind of what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> We're here, we love, you know, what we do, we love films, we love, you know, and feel privileged to be doing something that we enjoy doing and uh, so the other stuff you just just can't give it too much credence constant media attention was something that nicole would soon come to know was a fact of life proving that she wasn't about to be overshadowed by her megastar husband in 1995 she starred in to die for alongside matt dillon Nicole's character was Suzanne Stone Moretto, a wannabe television newscaster who is willing to do anything to get what she wants, even if it means killing her husband. While Nicole had no need to go that far, she's certainly no stranger to ambition. Rumour has it she called director Gus Van Sant personally to ensure she was cast ahead of rival actress Meg Ryan and later spent days locked in a motel room watching trash TV 
to make sure her American accent was the real deal. I think because she is raised in, in a world where television is everything, her whole upbringing, you know, she lives in a small town and she just wants so desperately to be noticed. I think some people had a slight suspicion that she was playing herself in To Die For and that she really was that ambitious and that ruthless. But because the film was so funny, it was like she was taking a little shot at herself and so you forgive her for it and end up liking her more because of it. To Die For confirmed her as a major talent. She received a British Academy Award nomination for Best Actress and walked away with a Best Actress Award for her work in the film at the 1996 Golden Globes. When she made To Die For, she showed us a whole new level of her acting skills. It was already apparent how focused she was, how committed she was and how much research she'd do for any role. But To Die For required something else. It required a lightness of touch, it required an intelligence and a real appreciation of that blackly comic style that it was shot in. Her next trip to the red carpet was to promote the action flick Batman Forever, in which she played Batman's love interest, Dr. Chase Meridian. As ever, Hollywood's golden couple were on hand to toast Batman Forever's success when it premiered in Los Angeles. Oh, it was, I mean, for me, it was just great fun to be, to be able to be involved in one of these movies. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. Nicole and Tom became well known for always being publicly supportive of each other's work. If there was a red carpet to be walked, you could guarantee that the couple would be walking it arm in arm. As any loving partner would, Nicole was always around to support her husband on his busier days. It was actually great to see him so enthused and, you know, working so hard. I think, you know, for the two of us, we're both very supportive of each other, so you really get excited when, uh, when the other one is doing something that they love doing. The success of Batman Forever straight after To Die For proved that Nicole could hold her own in a Hollywood blockbuster alongside big name stars like Jim Carrey, Val Kilmer and Tommy Lee Jones just as easily as she could play a very convincing psychopath in a small ensemble film like To Die For. Nicole was beginning to display a quality she has now become renowned for as an actor, versatility. Over the years, public opinion about Nicole Kidman seems to have changed. Sometimes she's the absolute darling, as she was after a split from Tom Cruise. Sometimes she seems to be perceived as some sort of aloof and quite cold figure. But through all the years, and no matter how divisive opinions are, people look back on To Die For as their favourite film. E even now, people say, oh, I don't really like Nicole Kidman, but I loved her in To Die For. And maybe that says something about the perception that she has generally. Nicole's next role took her to 19th century Europe for the period drama Portrait of a Lady. You know, as an actor, you want to be stretched. You want to be um, challenged. You want to do things that you think you can't do. So that's what was very exciting to me, was the, the I suppose, the way in which the two roles are quite extreme. Directed by New Zealander Jane Campion and adapted from Henry James' classic novel, Portrait of a Lady follows the story of a young American woman who challenges the usual expectations of life among conservative American expatriates in 19th century Europe. The film used many exotic locations, memories of which would stay with Nicole throughout her career. Here we get to go to Florence, Lucca, Roma, um, London. Uh, and I speak Italian, so I got to sort of speak some Italian in the movie. And it was beautiful. It was really one of the highlights that I, memories that I'll have for the rest of my life is making a movie in Italy. It's one of my favorite countries in the world. Working alongside co-stars John Malkovich, Martin Donovan and Barbara Hershey, Nicole proved that she could gracefully handle the convoluted dialogue of period drama. In fact, Nicole was such a fan of the original novel, she had committed to the project before the script was even finished. When I read a script, I either relate to the character or, or there's something in it that s hits me and I just say, wow, I would love to be involved in that project. And, you know, with this, it was the novel because I, I was signed on to do it before there was even a script. Nicole was riding high and it seemed like she was capable of anything. 
Her brilliant performance in Portrait of a Lady led to speculation that she would be nominated for a 1996 Academy Award. You take it as a great compliment and then you go back and do your work. <laughs> I think you just, you know, it's, it either happens or it doesn't happen um, and ultimately you keep working. This time though, the rumours were simply rumours. Nicole was not ultimately nominated for an Oscar. Husband Tom, however, did receive a nomination that same year for his Show Me The Money performance in Jerry Maguire. True to her motto of keep working, Nicole took on the role of Dr. Julia Kelly in the action thriller The Peacemaker. Expectations were high of both Nicole and the movie, and the pressure was on. Not least because it was to be the first film produced by Steven Spielberg's DreamWorks studio. The Peacemaker saw Nicole and co-star George Clooney on the hunt for a terrorist who has stolen nuclear weapons and is determined to destroy the United Nations building. Nicole was building a reputation for being a meticulous researcher when it came to her movie roles. The Peacemaker was no exception. When I started doing the research and realizing how many nuclear weapons really exist and where they exist, that was terrifying. That was something that I had no understanding of. And now, um, having an awareness that almost, mm, it, you think about it more and you worry about it more. Naturally, Nicole and George triumph and save the UN. Itself a landmark that would come to have significant meaning in Nicole's life and career to come. The late 1990s were a busy time for Nicole, both on a professional and personal level. She dabbled in a little witchcraft alongside Sandra Bullock in the comedy Practical Magic and spent six months studying the method at the New York Actors Studio. Meanwhile, she and Tom had adopted two children, son Connor and daughter Isabella. With million dollar incomes, lavish homes in Sydney and Los Angeles, and stellar careers, they were scaling heights no other Hollywood couple could match. Then came the rumours that they were deep in preparation for their first film together since Ron Howard's Far and Away in 1992. Directed by Stanley Kubrick, Eyes Wide Shut would tell the story of a New York doctor who embarks on a surreal, sexy adventure after his wife reveals that she has contemplated having an affair. At the time of making Eyes Wide Shut, Nicole and Tom were like king and queen of Hollywood. For them to be working together with a legendary director like Stanley Kubrick was always going to be the source of huge public and media fascination, and it was. And especially when everybody knew that the source story for Eyes Wide Shut was such an intense film about uh, sexuality and the relationship within a marriage. And so I think there was that sort of public perception that we're going to see what was really going on in the Kidman and Cruz marriage behind closed doors. Even to seasoned actors like Nicole and Tom, the prospect of being directed by a giant of filmmaking like Kubrick was a little daunting. And um, we all sat down, we went to the Standard House and we sat in a room um, with him and I was completely intimidated. I don't know about Tom, but I was. Well, he challenged convention just in his life and he knew, he knew and he created an environment in which he could flourish as, as a filmmaker and an artist, so that, that was inspiring. You know, there are few people working today that, that can do that, and he really knew how we wanted to make his movies, and, and uh, he did that. For Nicole and Tom, the project was first and foremost an opportunity to draw on their own experience, to create a detailed, and credible portrait of the complex dynamics of marriage. When we started the film, we'd been married for seven years, and we've now been married at the end of this year for 10 years. So, <laughs> there are many changes. <laughs> but um, I think we were, uh, if we had had to make this film earlier in our relationship, I, I don't think it would have been um, I don't think we would have given the performances we gave, and I don't think we would have been, um, I suppose, as willing to explore the different um, things that we had to explore in the film. 
Nicole and Tom found the combination of art and life made for a challenging and sometimes confronting rehearsal process. Stanley, Tom and I, our rehearsal process was sitting in a room, um, not standing up and doing the scenes, but sitting in a room and talking, talking about um, things that are very intimate and very private and a lot of the times things you would not necessarily want to deal with or want to say to your your spouse so it it was um it was a really interesting time it was and i think ultimately it really strengthened us and it was a great gift to have that um particularly at that time of our relationship and then also now to have the film because of kubrick's secrecy about the film rumors flew thick and fast about its plot and content the film's sexual themes provoked much speculation, with some journalists writing that it would be the sexiest film ever made. The film is about sex, but it's about so many other things as well, and I think that it, uh, it got blown out of proportion, actually, the, the uh, well, there's sex in it. I don't necessarily think movie. it's about sex. It's, it's about, about some sexual obsession and relationships and, uh, you know, the dynamic of marriage. Sadly, Stanley Kubrick passed away in 1999, four days after screening the final cut of the film. And despite the hype, many critics did not find Eyes Wide Shut to be as sexy as they had hoped, with some reviews calling the film cold and slow. Eyes Wide Shut is a cold film. It is a slow film. And it's not at all sexy, it's not at all erotic, but it's not supposed to be. It's a film about sex, and it's a film about sexual relations in marriages, but it's not a sexy film. When people talk about chemistry between actors, they're talking about spontaneity, which in a Kubrick film is pretty much impossible because he does so many takes that for an actor to be spontaneous after the 46th take is nigh on impossible. They're also talking about that little erotic zing between actors, which in a film like this, isn't there and isn't appropriate because it's a film of ideas and it's a film about when there are cracks in the marriage and how they show themselves. Yet some tabloids still linked the lack of sizzle to marital difficulties between its two stars. Rumours and gossip had long since become part of their daily lives, but Nicole was determined not to let the tabloids go too far. Both the Star and the National Enquirer were served with suits for claiming that Nicole and Tom needed sex therapists on set to help them get in the mood for Eyes Wide Shut's more erotic scenes. But in public at least, Nicole and Tom presented a united front. As it turned out, however, there was plenty of trouble in paradise. In news that blindsided even the celebrity watchers, Nicole and Tom announced their separation in February of 2001. Tom filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences between the couple. Nicole was said to be stunned by his sudden change of heart and allegedly begged him to stay and seek marriage counselling. But there was no turning back for Tom. The shock separation inevitably sparked a media frenzy. During the months following the announcement, magazines and gossip columns were flooded with sensational stories and reports of what had gone on behind closed doors. Some sources claimed that the couple had celebrated their 10th wedding anniversary on Christmas Eve of 2000 by renewing their vows in a romantic private ceremony. However, according to Tom's divorce filing, the two had split in December, just before their anniversary. Then came the speculation that Tom's timing had been influenced by the fact that under Californian law, after 10 years of marriage, a spouse is liable to pay alimony until the partner remarries. But could penny pinching really have been a motive for a top Hollywood star earning around $25 million a movie? There were also reports that Nicole had been in the early stages of pregnancy at the time of the shock split, and that the stress of the breakup had led to a tragic miscarriage. How much truth lay behind any of these rumors may never be known. But there was no doubt that Tom had moved on when pictures of him and his Vanilla Sky co-star Penelope Cruz began hitting the front pages. Exactly what irreconcilable differences drove Nicole and Tom apart have rightly never been made public. 
But speculation centres on Tom's rumoured insistence that his wife embrace his controversial religion, Scientology. Tom has since married his third wife, actress Katie Holmes. Just as Tom made no secret of his newfound love, when he announced it by jumping on Oprah Winfrey's couch, Katie has made no secret of the fact that she has joined her husband, not only in marriage, but in his faith. Oh yeah, I, I have been um, learning about it and um, I've really been enjoying it. I've been listening to some um, congresses and I've started auditing and I really enjoy it. It's really helping me out a lot. While her marriage was struggling, Nicole shielded herself from the turmoil of her personal life by doing what she does best, throwing herself body and soul into her work. And what better role to occupy her than one that would require her not only to act, but also sing and dance. Milan Rouge was really important for Nicole because it was the first major film after a split from Tom Cruise. So public sympathy was kind of high and on her side and everybody was really hoping that she'd do well. It's a musical yet it's a love story yet it's got really high comedy yet it, I mean it's so many things so it's so hard to describe the movie. Directed by fellow Australian Baz Luhrmann, Moulin Rouge was a lavish musical set in an infamous Parisian nightclub. Nicole was cast as the sultry and seductive Satine, alongside Ewan McGregor, who finds himself plunged into a decadent world where anything goes, except falling in love. It's about love, it's about belief, it's about, I mean, the, the, the message at the end of the film is um, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Losing love was something all too fresh in Nicole's heart. During the promotional tour for Moulin Rouge, she admitted feeling overwhelmed at times by the attention given to her recent divorce. And the people want to, want to know out there, like about your personal life, anything you talk about, yeah, have you moved on from Tom? Is that? I don't think you ever move on. Yeah. You know, I think you, I think that, you know, but certainly, anyway, too, too personal. Yeah. Despite her personal life being in the spotlight, Nicole's incredible work in Moulin Rouge proved that nothing was going to upstage her most versatile performance yet. Nothing else. No one can deny that she's a surprise. Like, you see parts of her you haven't seen before. And I think it's true, you know. And, and she is, in her very essence, like an old-style movie star in the sense that she can be wacky funny, tear your heart out, and then she's got this singing, dancing ability now, so... Nicole even found time that same year to record the number one single, Something Stupid, with Robbie Williams for Christmas of 2001. Singing, usually confined to the shower. <laughs> I sang in a band when I was 17, um, where I, I would do the Blondie covers. That, and that was the extent of my singing career. And then suddenly, you know, when I got cast in this film, I was in a recording studio with people who'd recorded with Madonna and Annie Lennox and Bjork. I mean, it was amazing for me. Entirely shot on sound stages at Sydney's Fox Studios, Moulin Rouge was an incredibly demanding experience for Nicole, who injured her knee while filming a complicated dance sequence. Just the, just the idea of having to work. We worked 17 hours a day on this thing to get it done because we didn't have a huge budget to make it and so you know you have to work longer hours to get everything done and he's a very demanding director <laughs> a fantastic director but extremely demanding so I mean the, the physical sort of thing of being very tired and still having to get through it but you know as an actor you dream of working on something like this with the fur still flying in the press about her breakup from Tom, Nicole's performance in Moulin Rouge finally gave the media something else to talk about. Public sympathy was so high for Nicole Kidman at that point, she really would have had to make a major mess up for it not to work. And she didn't. She showed us that she could sing and she could dance and she could act all at the same time, which is a triple whammy, really. But I think out of context, her performance is overshadowed by that of Ewan McGregor's because there's something so vivid and vital and alive about Ewan McGregor in that film. He's, he's completely compelling, whereas Nicole Kidman's sateen is slightly more ethereal and hard to grasp a hold of. However she had managed to pull it off, the scorned woman had certainly picked herself up, dusted herself off 
and turned in an award-winning performance. Her all-singing, all-dancing role in Moulin Rouge won her a Golden Globe for Best Actress in a Motion Picture Musical or Comedy in 2002. Having already won the public sympathy vote, she was now being painted in the media as a champion of triumph over adversity. The success of Moulin Rouge also saw a huge resurgence in popularity for movie musicals worldwide. It's really exciting to know that there's other musicals now being made, like Chicago's going to be made and Rent, and, and it's nice to have been part of a film that started, hopefully, um, a whole new... I mean, we get to see musicals again, which is terrific. <laughs> Nicole's next role would take her a long way from the glitz and glamour of the musical to a much darker place in The Others. True to form, Nicole chose a role that was as different to her previous one as possible. Well, actually, last year I made both these films and I was so lucky because I got to do Moulin Rouge and um, The Others in the one year. And creatively, as an actress, you just don't get to do such diverse characters. And that was the thing, that they were both so different, to play Satine in uh, a courtesan and then to go and play this sort of very sexually repressed woman who's trapped in this house. You know, that's, that's fun. <laughs> Directed by Alejandro Amenabar, The Others is a terrifying tale of a young mother living with her children in a seemingly haunted country mansion. I love the, I love the genre. I love, to, I love to be scared. I like to go and see a movie where I scream and jump, and but it's, uh, it's something that I enjoy to see. So, Unfortunately for Nicole, the knee injury she sustained while shooting Moulin Rouge flared up during production of The Others, forcing her to pull out of the lead role in her next picture, David Fincher's Panic Room. The role went to Jodie Foster, but Nicole still has a presence in the film as a voice on the telephone. Likewise, it was Nicole's voice, or her transformation of it, that got people talking about her next role this time in the low-budget English film, Birthday Girl. I mean, it's sort of a black comedy, romantic comedy, thriller, um, quirky, weird film. <laughs> but it's, um, I think it's got a lot of heart to it as well, which is what I liked about it. You know, the unlikely coupling of these two people. Yet, I think there's something quite beautiful about how, um, People who are so different can still be so right together. For the hugely challenging task of playing a Russian mail-order bride, Nicole had to learn to speak and swear in Russian. Nicole's radical conversion into the treacherous character won over even the toughest of critics. Even speaking such kind of terrible words and even um, acting such kind of a girl, uh, Nicole Kidman is um, uh, still very beautiful and attractive woman. Uh, and uh, it is nice uh, to see such a face <laughs> of Russian, a Russian lady in the cinema. So it is sensation. To achieve this metamorphosis, Nicole sought help from a woman who worked at the Russian Embassy in Australia. She'd never worked on a film before and I just said, teach me, teach me um, Russian, teach me how to speak as a Russian. And so I didn't work with a dialect coach on the actual Russian, I just worked with a Russian girl. If transformations were becoming part of Nicole's trademark, she was about to up the ante in a role which would at last earn her the Best Actress Oscar that had so far eluded her. In 2002, she starred alongside Meryl Streep and Julianne Moore in The Hours, playing the tragically short-lived novelist Virginia Woolf. I think I just loved her, you know? I just, as I found out more and more about her, um, I just thought how much I admired her and respected her and was fascinated by her. I mean, she's fascinating and her ability to put her thoughts and her struggle and all of the ideas that she had about life and connections and into these stories. It's just wonderful. While Virginia Woolf was a great novelist, she certainly wasn't known for her great physical beauty. Such was Nicole's dedication, she surprised the film's producers by insisting that she substantially alter her appearance for the role. 
For the hours, Nicole wore a prosthetic nose, which made her almost unrecognisable as the famous beauty we know and love. I never watched daily, so I just saw the makeup test, really, and then after that, I didn't give it a second thought. I basically, you know, it was more just about... I didn't want to be overwhelmed or intimidated by um, her too much, because at first it was daunting, and then I went, no, 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 I've just got to be true to this woman. I've got to find her, I've got to step in and just do it, you know, and not monitor or censor anything. Nicole's portrayal of Virginia Woolf was acclaimed by film critics worldwide. Hollywood has a history of giving Oscars to actors who actually deserve them for previous films or better performances, like Elizabeth Taylor winning for Butterfield 8 when she was much more interesting in Cat and Hot in Roof or Suddenly Last Summer. And around the time of the hours, Nicole Kidman also made films like Dogville, which is a much more interesting film. But the Academy likes a bit of literary illusion, so the hours wins out. The hours was such a success that when 2003's Golden Globe Awards rolled around, Nicole found herself in competition with her own co-stars, Meryl Streep and Julianne Moore. The Golden Globes, however, were just a warm-up for the big event. On Oscar night, Nicole was honoured with her first Academy Award for Best Actress. Having reached this important milestone in her career, Nicole was faced with the difficult choice of what project to take on next. It's very difficult to not get um, distorted in your view of where you want to go and what you want to do. And I think you just constantly have to come back to the simplicity of, I want to work with interesting people, I want to work with um, people that have something to say, um, and try to do films that are relevant, you know, to what you're feeling at this time. I know that sounds sort of like waffle, but it actually <laughs> has some meaning to me. If Nicole had played a supporting role to Tom Cruise throughout their marriage, she had now well and truly come into her own. With an Oscar and a Golden Globe win for the hours, she was presented with her own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2003 and was being praised by one of the most powerful women in Hollywood. What really happens with Nicole is that her entire body changes, her voice changes, and she literally becomes invisible, and all you see is Virginia Woolf. And this to me is amazing, because we all know that Nicole Kidman could have become a giant star just based on her looks. But instead, she has become a giant star based on her enormous talent. She is a simply brilliant actress. She wasted no time in testing her versatility even further by signing up for three very different films, Dogville, The Human Stain and Cold Mountain. The three projects would see Nicole working in very diverse locations, from the bare soundstage of Lars von Trier's Dogville to the farmland of rural Romania. There is something beautiful about being, um, instead of in a studio, being out in the mountains. And we were in the mountains of Romania and we were working um, in this beautiful sort of fresh air with trees. I mean, the, the conditions were extreme. But at the same time, I'm much more an outdoors person than an indoors person. So if it's a choice between a studio and a location, I'll take the location any time. After the gruelling process of making three films in rapid succession, came the gruelling job of flying around the world to promote them. In between filming her next projects, she managed to squeeze in some family time. I'm in the process of finishing Set for Wives and then I'm going back to see my mum and dad and my dad's coming over to see me in a week, so... And my sister just had another baby, so she's coming over in three weeks to New York. A rather less joyful part of Nicole's life was the constant torrent of tabloid gossip directed at her. Rumours were doing the rounds that she and her Cold Mountain co-star Jude Law had an affair while making the film, causing the breakup of his marriage to Sadie Frost. Nicole denied the rumours and successfully sued British newspapers, The Sun and The Daily Mail, donating the proceeds to charity. But then having taken over from Julia Roberts as the highest paid actress in Hollywood, she could afford to. 
Not only could she now command more than $20 million per movie, she was also riding high on her status as the world's number one fashion icon. Even more impressively and annoyingly, choosing just the right outfit seemed to come effortlessly to Nicole. Pretty decisive. I just sort of see a dress that I like and I go, mm-hmm, that's what I'm going to wear. <laughs> I, don't, I don't put an enormous amount of um, deliberation into it, and I, but I just sort of know what I like and I go, yeah, that seems like I would feel comfortable in it. I do like to be able to sit down in it and I like to be able to eat in it. Her porcelain skin, immaculate style and perfect poise had long been drawing comparisons with classic golden age beauties like Audrey Hepburn and her statuesque frame had made her the favourite clothes horse of top designers like Karl Lagerfeld and Balenciaga. In 2004, Nicole was crowned Woman of the Year at the Elle Style Awards. Once again, she was playing down her style queen status. I feel very uncomfortable doing these things, sitting talking to a camera and not being there able to party, so I've got my own little pathetic bottle of champagne, <laughs> my own glass, and I'm going to sit here and, um, and have a toast. The same year, Nicole signed a deal to become the face of Chanel No. 5 perfume and featured in a $42 million three-minute film directed by Baz Luhrmann to promote the fragrance. Her reported fee of around $3.7 million has made her the highest paid actor on record, earning more than $1 million per minute of screen time. But having reached the pinnacle of her career in terms of earnings and celebrity status, she was still hungry for new challenges in her film work. And her next big challenge came in the shape of her 2004 movie, Birth. Directed by Jonathan Glazer and co-starring Lauren Bacall, it's centred on a woman who becomes convinced that a 10-year-old boy is the reincarnation of her dead husband. The film, which involves Nicole taking a bath with the boy, asked more questions than it answered and sparked a wave of controversy. There was a lot of hoo-ha at the time because the 10-year-old boy's got a man trapped inside his body and there are scenes, there's a scene particularly in the bath with Nicole Kidman and the boy. But it's shot very carefully. They're hardly in the same room when they're actually shooting it. And I think it was really a bit of a storm in a teacup. I love to make films that cause discussion, which is why I don't like to actually answer specifically what does this mean or... Because particularly on something like this, people debate it and they all have a different... You know, was, was it really her husband or was it... I mean, it, there's, it's divided. Then after starring in remakes of The Stepford Wives and 60s comedy series Bewitched, Nicole moved on to some more conventional material, a good old-fashioned thriller. The Interpreter, directed by Sidney Pollock and co-starring Sean Penn, would be the first movie ever filmed inside the world-famous United Nations building in New York. It's an honour, actually, to be shooting here. And, uh, and we're, we shoot on the weekends so that everything can still get done during the week. <laughs> the United Nations itself had been playing an increasingly important role in Nicole's off-screen life. Having been involved with UNICEF for almost 15 years, she was soon to be appointed as a goodwill ambassador for UNIFEM, the United Nations Development Fund for Women. We're here today because Nicole Kidman has agreed to become a different kind of UN interpreter. An interpreter of the United Nations message that we will not achieve our human development ambitions until women are able to participate fully in the process. I, for one, am very pleased that Ms Kidman has accepted UNIFEM's invitation to become a United Nations Goodwill Ambassador. Nicole had first become aware of the United Nations Development Fund for Women after her mother heard a program on the radio about the work that UNIFEM was doing in Cambodia to create economic opportunities for rural women by reviving traditional skills. And this, this really moved me. Um, and it was at that point that I tracked down <laughs> who was the head of UNIFEM, 
this woman here, and I called her up and I said, listen, um, I heard about some of this work. I don't know what else you're doing for women, but I would very much like to be able to help you and be involved in any way that I can. Nicole's role as Unifem's goodwill ambassador has taken her even further afield than her most out-of-the-way film shoots. But even her film roles still serve to remind Nicole of the reasons she has taken on this important charity work. I did a film, The Human Stain, where I went and met with um, a lot of women in shelters, um, abuse shelters, and I think the stories that I heard there, and this was in America, um, were so disturbing um, that that probably, as I was saying, the layer upon layer of things that lead you to something like this, a position like this. So I know that, that those stories very much contributed to me going, I have to find a way in which I can somehow help these people. And I think when you've been given a lot in life, it's very much your duty to, to find the places where you can give back. Perhaps it was all that good karma that brought her the romantic reward she'd failed to find since splitting with Tom in 2000. After a string of rumoured romances with stars like Robbie Williams, Adrian Brody and Lenny Kravitz, Nicole finally met country singer Keith Urban at a gala dinner in Los Angeles honouring noted Australians in 2005. Rumours of a romance started circulating soon after, when Nick and Keith were spotted dining out together and Nicole even joined him on tour. It wasn't long before the pair went public and on June 25, 2006, a week after Nicole's 39th birthday, they were married at the Cardinal Soretti Memorial Chapel in the grounds of St. Patrick's Estate in Sydney. For the whole week leading up to the marriage, Australia's paparazzi had been camped outside her parents' home. Family and friends of the bride and groom were pretty happy about the way things had turned out too. I feel very proud of my young brother and um, this, the circle's closed, it's wonderful. Wonderful. Absolutely amazing. Love everywhere. It's the service was just, it was beautiful. Of course we cried. <laughs> we cried, we laughed, we danced, we sang. Sadly, within four months of their wedding, Nicole's new husband had checked himself into the Betty Ford Centre. The country megastar had publicly acknowledged a former addiction to cocaine and released a statement expressing his regret for the hurt his relapse had caused Nicole and his family. Nicole stood by her man and with her unwavering support, Keith stayed the course and started the long road to recovery. At an Australian awards show in 2007, he paid tribute to her strength and loyalty. It wouldn't exist without my wife. She was the inspiration for it, so I dedicate this award to you, baby. He'd written a song for her on his Love, Pain and the Whole Crazy Thing album and had found stability in their marriage, which had to endure long periods of separation due to their work commitments. I mean, the same as any married couple where you've got both husband and wife working. I mean, it's a, that, that's pretty normal in the sense that you, it's, it's very hard. I mean, you've got other, other married couples that have got kids and all this other stuff and they manage to, to make it work. So, you know, for us, it's, it's much easier, but, but it still requires making time. That's, that's the common thread in all relationships is you don't find time, you make the time. In Nicole and Keith's case, making time was particularly difficult. While Keith was working on his album and preparing to go on tour, Nicole was on the red carpet promoting her latest collaboration with her Dead Calm director, George Miller. 
Instead of putting her in front of the camera, their latest venture took her behind the microphone to lend her voice to a singing penguin in the animated smash hit, Happy Feet. Next, she was battling marauding aliens in action thriller, The Invasion, a remake of sci-fi classic, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I loved the idea of playing a woman and in an action film, but set in the science fiction genre. Alien is one of my favorite films. So uh, Sigourney Weaver is the coolest. But the shoot was perhaps a little more action-packed than Nicole had hoped. We were doing a stunt and some, this guy was driving and, and he drove the car and we smashed into a, a huge telegraph pole. So I was, yeah, I was knocked out and I broke two ribs. But at least her injury wasn't completely in vain. I said to them, you've got to put this in the movie because there's no way I'm going to have gone through all of this um, and not have it in the movie, and there it is in the movie. Nicole's next movie was fortunately a little more sedate. She teamed up with Jack Black and Jennifer Jason Lee for the family drama Margot at the Wedding. For her next trick, Nicole threw herself into unfamiliar territory, portraying the sinister Mrs. Coulter in the fantasy epic The Golden Compass gave Nicole her first opportunity to play a villain since To Die For back in 1995. Obviously, you know, in my career, what I'm looking to do is shake things up. I don't like doing the same thing over and over. I certainly don't choose things just for the sake of being liked or anything. I'm, I'm very into um, working with interesting directors and, and seeking out things that are different. And I saw this as something different. In recent years, particularly, Nicole seems to have had much more success, both critically and almost commercially, with her small indie films than she has with the big budget things. But even with the big budget film like Golden Compass, she's still going for interesting, challenging roles that have that can show something different about her. And what I liked about Golden Compass is that she's playing a really taboo character. She's playing an evil mother. In the same year that she makes a huge blockbuster like The Golden Compass, she also makes a film like Margot at the Wedding, which is a tiny little ensemble film just for the art house circuit. She takes a fraction of the, of the pay that she normally does. And it, it's not a particularly uh, sympathetic or winning character, but it's an interesting character. And you can see why she does it, because she really does believe in the script. After that, it was back to more familiar territory. Her next project teamed her up with her old friend and collaborator, Baz Luhrmann, and took her from the air-conditioned comfort of a studio to the blistering heat of Australia's Northern Territory. What's interesting about the Northern Territory of the 1930s was that it was a little bit of Asia, a little bit of the Wild West, a little bit of Africa, all mixed in a sort of natural, creating a natural and very unique environment. In Australia, Nicole plays a British aristocrat who comes to Australia and falls in love with Hugh Jackman's character, an outback drover. The hype surrounding the film was enormous, but even a huge star like Nicole found that the Australian people still treat her as one of their own. I was like, in Darwin, everyone's the same, you know, they're very warm, I'd go and get a facial and a massage, you know, and the girls in the, in the beautician were just kind of, just lovely. And so I just think the warmth in which the country, you just feel it throughout the whole country, I understand why people come here and go, they want to move here. The warmth was turned up several notches when Keith and Nicole announced that they were expecting a baby soon after filming wrapped on Australia. Um, I knew that they were pregnant and I think that's great news. I think she's going to be an incredible mother and she seems like she's a real warm personality and I think they're going to be fantastic parents. On Monday the 7th of July 2008, the news came from Nashville that Nicole had given birth to a baby girl, Sunday Rose Kidman Urban. Less than a month later, Nicole and Keith were back in Sydney, proudly showing off their new addition to friends and family. With two teenage children and a brand new baby to care for, as well as her marriage to Keith, journalists were keen to know how she would go about balancing her family life with her career. My family's my priority. I don't think there, it's, it's not really about the balance, it's about that comes first and then 
um, if some, if these things fit in, then I'll do them. But I'm more than willing to walk away from a film or a project, you know, so they don't have to be separated from my family. Still managing to look as though she's just stepped out of hair and makeup after nearly 20 years of juggling the roles of mother, movie star, fashion icon and UN ambassador, Nicole Kidman clearly possesses the kind of focus and energy that most of us would kill for. Sometimes I say she's mad, but I love her. And what I mean by that, that's not a madness, but it's she's so vital and full of life and like, like a lightning and a fireworks and an energy that you, when you're around her, whether you're on the set, whether it's in a film, whether she just comes around for a cup of tea, it makes life a bit more exciting and light seems to bounce off the walls and you feel kind of excited, you know? Tireless in her charity work, Nicole relishes her role as Unifem Goodwill Ambassador, which continues to draw attention to the plight of disadvantaged women around the world. She is also a patron of the Sydney Children's Hospital, and in 2006, all her hard work was recognised with a Companion of the Order of Australia, Australia's highest civilian honour. During an interview back in 2003, Nicole suggested that she might be thinking about opting for a quieter life. Um, I know, though, that I probably won't do this for the rest of my life. There's other things that interest me. Um, and um, I think probably when I fall in love, um, you know, that's when I will stop doing as much of this because I will want to settle down again. However, after falling in love with Keith and giving birth to Sunday Rose, the girl from Oz is showing no signs of slowing down. With more film projects already in production, she won't be heading off to the outback just yet.